WDIO-TV, Channel 10, Duluth Superior. Vietnam Peace Conference halted, and David Wheat comes home. We'll be in all Iron Range Region 7 hockey final. Don't feel bad, DM. At least you had hair while your wig was missing. What about Denny? What about Denny? He's looking for precipitation, too, on his head. This is News 10 Tonight with Dennis Anderson, Bill Steffel, Jim Schwinn, and Jack McKenna. Brought to you tonight by First Federal Savings and Loan. Good evening once again, everybody. The Vietnam Peace Conference is now ground to a halt. President Nixon ordered Secretary of State William Rogers to boycott the sessions until Hanoi explains why it's holding up the scheduled release of American POWs. Rogers has been asked for a statement of clarification from the North Vietnamese and described the matter as being of the highest priority before other business can be handled. Well, that high priority is evidenced by the fact that White House News Secretary Ron Ziegler made a statement today that he said was almost word for word what President Nixon felt on that matter. There can be no ambiguity on the matter of the release of United States prisoners. There is no relationship between the release of United States prisoners and civilian prisoners held in South Vietnam. This point was specifically spelled out in the negotiations and in the agreement as signed. The release of United States prisoners is related only to the rate of U.S. withdrawal from South Vietnam and to nothing else. We have now withdrawn over half of our forces, and it is now time for the other side to immediately release the next group of United States prisoners of war to bring the total of all those released up to at least 50 percent of the total number scheduled for release. In Los Angeles, the defense has begun his case of the Pentagon Papers trial. Attorney for the defendants, Leonard Wineglass, expects to call as many as 30 or 40 witnesses in that case. It was only yesterday, at the end of the prosecution's testimony, that the judge threw out one of the charges against the defendants. Now that the defense has started, we have a report on the first day's activities. Attorney Leonard Wineglass spoke for the defense. He said the evidence will show that not one page of the Pentagon Papers contained vital military information about Vietnam. He said the motives of the defendants, Ellsberg and Russo, are not important because he said there was no violation of any law in releasing the documents marked top secret. Instead, he said it's the government that's trying to bend and distort the law to cover its own mistakes in Vietnam. Weinglass told the jury the prosecution hasn't even proved that releasing the Pentagon Papers would have damaged national security. He said there are a few military facts in the papers, but all of them were outdated or in the public domain by 1969. Weinglass, a veteran of the Chicago 7 trial, said the Pentagon Papers are simply a history of the troublesome role played by this country in Vietnam, a study of our mistakes and miscalculations. As this trial goes on, the defense will call into court as many as 40 witnesses, a former ambassador, White House advisors, admirals and army officers, the men who participated in the process of our involvement in Vietnam. A former Internal Revenue Service employee who is now the head of the IRS union accused the IRS of pressuring its, its agents into a quota system. Vincent Connery told a Senate subcommittee that pressure was applied to agents to report a certain number of deficiency payments from taxpayers whose returns they audit. A spokesman for the IRS has denied that charge. In Philadelphia, the bitter eight-week-long strike by teachers has come to an end. Agreement reached today on a new four-year contract costing more than $68.5 million. Meanwhile, strikes in London are not only continuing, but show every indication that they may be expanded to strike in this winter of British labor discontent. Their series of short walkouts has closed hundreds of schools. The teachers say they are victims of inflation but are damaged even more by government efforts to control it. But like the thousands of other workers on strike, the teachers seem to be getting little sympathy from the inflation-weary public. College students also are on the march asking for increased tuition grants. Their rhetoric is typical of the growing confrontation between the government and those who oppose its anti-inflation controls. You are going back to your colleges to carry on this fight. We're not giving up until we get a grant increase out of this government. All this bloody government goes, because if that's what we've got to fight for in the end, that's what we'll do. A lot of working people who are usually less militant than the students have joined the battle. They include 200,000 hospital workers who have never before gone on strike. 80% of these non-medical employees, kitchen help, orderlies, and others, take home less than $50 a week. They want $10 more. Britain's trainmen have begun work slowdowns to press demands for a 30% wage boost. But the government refuses to weaken its increased limits, hoping to trim inflation now running at 10% a year. Frustrated commuters appear unsympathetic to the trainmen. 
Perhaps the least popular strike so far is that of the gas workers. The gas men earn less than many other workers, but their strikes have aroused public anger over resulting hardships. Social workers who daily deliver hot meals to the ill and the elderly have increased their visits to those most endangered by lack of heat, the shut-ins. One of them is Fred Ashcroft, age 90. He's confined to his chilly South London home. They're not on the bread line, these people. If they were on the bread line, I would say yes. They refuse two pounds, didn't they? You'll give me two pounds extra a week on my pension, and then I'll be very pleased. Those suffering because of the strikes often get more public sympathy than the strikers. And that feeling may increase as more unions threaten to walk out. There is even talk of a general strike. Another death in Northern Ireland, this time a 13-year-old boy, died of gunshot wounds after British soldiers claimed to have shot and killed a sniper. The soldiers say they could not get to the body of that sniper because a mob of people kept them away. Shortly after the incident, the young boy was brought to a hospital with two gunshot wounds, which proved fatal. This portion of News 10 tonight is brought to you by the folks at First Federal. When you live in Duluth, you've got a lot to enjoy, a lot to do, a lot to try. You know that your backyard, your lakes and hills, challenge your time and imagination any time you're ready to make the most of it. There's security here, too, in knowing what will stay tomorrow, what will be good tomorrow, what will be yours tomorrow. That's why so many Duluthians own their own homes. That's why the folks at First Federal have helped so many Duluthians finance those homes for the security of a good tomorrow. A home of your own belongs with a good life in Duluth. And helping you with the right money at the right time is the job of the people at First Federal. Ask them. They can help you make it happen. First Federal Savings and Loan, downtown Duluth. Equal housing lender.